Hi, everybody. Welcome to the recovery, Overeaters Anonymous recovery and relapse meeting. It is the 9th of March, uh, 2021. And today I am delighted to introduce our speaker, Anita H, who is from Ireland. And she came into OA and has, reco well, has recovery since um, April 2014. And she's going to share her story with us today. So take it away, Anita. And just to confirm, Anita, you have consented to be recorded, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. OK, Great. take it away, love. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rita. Thanks so much for asking me. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm really, really grateful to be here. Um, God, I just got really nervous there just before. And I just said a little prayer to God. And I just said, look, you know, I give it to you, God. And whatever is meant to come out will come out. Um, OK, so um, my name is Anita. I'm a compulsive overeater. Um, I'm very grateful and blessed by the grace of God to be living in the solution today um, and to be in recovery. But um, yeah, I have a long history in OA and um, I, yeah, I can probably, you know, throw a few words out around relapse and my experience in the rooms. Um, and first of all, a sponsee asked me yesterday, you know, um, what's this with people saying recovered and some people saying, you know, whatever. And, you know, um, I kind of, that kind of stuff doesn't really, you know, it's, it's no big deal to me, but I was thinking about it last night and I was thinking about, you know, when somebody kind of, you know, says they're, they're, you know, a label or this or an alcoholic or a drug addict or whatever. And I was thinking, I was like, what are they really saying? You know, I was thinking like, what am I saying when I'm saying that I'm a compulsive overeater? You know, and I thought about it, you know, um, I'm, I'm telling you that I'm a person, you know, that was in pain. I'm telling you that I'm a person who uh, didn't get the book on doing life, you know. Um, and I'm really telling you that I'm a person who chose food to self-soothe and to self-medicate. So, so that's what I'm telling you. Um, I'm not telling you I'm a bad person, you know. Um, I'm not telling you I'm a good person either. I'm just... That's what I'm saying when I'm saying that I'm a compulsive overeater. Um, with regard to relapse, there's two kind of things that always, I, I, I just always come to mind when, you know, I hear people talk about relapse and they talk about, you know, um, I used to hear around the rooms all the time, you know, relapse happens in the absence of a strong recovery program. I always remember that. Um, and I always remember, you know, um, if you put anything else before your recovery, um, you lose your recovery and they're kind of two kind of things um, that are you know they're really important to me to remember and as you'll hear from my share they're they're quite pertinent <laughs> um, and not really to go kind of too much into my past but you know just to kind of briefly kind of say that you know um, I do come from a family of addiction I do come a fam you know I was reared in a home where there was neglect and where there was abuse and um, there was dysfunction and mental illness and all of that um, and you know I, I my first memory of food is at the age of six and um, being given food you know to literally soothe me in a crisis situation um, and food for me was it was just that warm feeling, I suppose, that, you know, you'd look from like you'd look from a hug for your from your mother or your father or, you know, get your needs met as a child. And, and that's what food was for me. Um, and, um, you know, I know there's plenty of people in the rooms that don't come from that background. And in many ways, you know, as I've shared, people who've heard me before will say it kind of doesn't matter in one way because I'm a compulsive overeater. And I'm a compulsive overeater, whether it was a white picket fence, you know, or it wasn't like this is my situation and this is the disease that I have now. Um, so I grew up from that home and um, I suppose what you're going to get now is like a, a little bit of a sense of a theme. Um, you know, I grew up and for me, because of my background and the experiences that I had, um, I was just all about self-control, self-sufficiency, self-will self-motivation, self-propulsion, <laughs> uh, self-reliance. So you get, you're getting the theme there. Um, self. Um, because I didn't have anyone to rely on, so I only relied on myself. Um, I was a very goal-orientated person. I was a very focused person. Um, and I got a lot of approval and, you know, um, for that. Um, outwardly, I had the job, the house, the car, you know, all the things. 
Um, but you know, food, food was my thing. But at that stage, before OA, I could control my food as well as I could control my life. My life was micromanaged to a minute, the minute, you know, I remember I'd have my train times down to the minutes. Um, I'd have my everything down to the minutes. Um, and my food started to get out of hand. And, you know, I, I, I this is my, my, you know, I went away, you know, and uh, like, honestly, I can tell you that I really just wanted a food plan. I really just wanted to be given a piece of paper and be told that if I um, followed this food plan, I would be thin. And I had no interest in sponsorship. I had no interest in service. I had no interest in the steps. I don't think I even looked beyond the third step. I don't even think I even knew like what a fourth step was. I didn't even know um, any of that because I had no interest. Um, I was looking to apply the same principles that I was applying in my life to OA. And so it was going to be an ETHIS plan, an ETHIS program, you know, um, I was going to pick and choose the bits I wanted and the people were really nice and it was lovely to meet up, you know, a couple of times a week and have the chats, you know, and find this magic way of cutting out, you know, I, I, I would have gone in a very, very, um, what should I, what would I say, a very, like the harsher the food plan, the better, you know, um, the, the thinner I get um, and just hard, just hardcore. Um, I, I stopped binging. Um, but I didn't find a solution, you know, and I certainly didn't even know that it was meant to be a spiritual solution. <laughs> I just thought it was a food plant solution. Um, so I kind of came in and out of my way and I came out and I went out and I had many relapses and I thought it was a cult and I thought they were all dry and I judged everybody in the rooms, but I was the one eating, but I was judging them. And uh, I thought it was all away. And I used to look up things that you know, were very negative about 12 step programs. And I spent thousands on therapy and I had personal trainers and I did the paleo and I did the all the different things. And I thought if I could get the root to the root of my childhood pain, I would um, eliminate my eating disorder. And I didn't. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and say none of it was of any benefit. That's that would be, wouldn't be true. But it didn't help me with food, did not help me with food. My food progressed. And as I started to have children, my food got worse and worse and worse because I also was a doer because I couldn't sit still. So you put me at home with a new baby. I could not cope and I ate. Um, so listen, that's the abbreviated version. <laughs> I did that for many, many years in the rooms, many years in the rooms. Um, I, I left, uh, as I said, several times and I'd come back but I'd get real high about new food plans and I'd get obsessed about whether it was six ounces of something or eight ounces of something or you know I think it was all in whatever the food was I just missed the point you know um and I came back um and you know again I, I don't you know it, briefly just to say you know I, I thought I was gonna die I was suicidal I wanted to kill myself. My marriage was in real difficulty. I was really scared for my sanity. Like, I mean, really scared. Um, I knew I had three kids. I was just, I knew this was just desperate. You know, um, my, young, my older kids would be doing their homework and I'd be binging down the end of the kitchen, you know, with all the food hidden in the press. And then I'd be going upstairs because I progressed onto bulimia and I'd be making myself sick. And, you know, I was hiding food. I was stopping in the bins in my neighborhood and, you know, putting the food in there. I was eating takeaway food in my car, burning my mouth. Um, I was baking. The stuff wouldn't even be out of the oven. I would be burning my mouth to eat it. I ate the bottom layer of my wedding cake from the freezer. I put food in the bin. I took it back out. You know, I've done it all. All the stuff that you hear about, I did it. Um, so I came back and I sat and I cried that night in that meeting. I remember the clothes I wore. I remember everything. I remember the whole thing. And I remember thinking, what would all these people think that here I was back with my humble pie? And you know what? Those people that I had judged and I had said, oh, they're this and they're that, they welcomed me with open arms. And I'll never forget that, you know? Um, and I came back. And what I want to say that was different then 
is that, um, you know, I hear a lot about, you know, the gift of desperation. And I heard somebody on the vision line the other day saying, God, gift of desperation. I'd never heard that before. Um, and really, it's the greatest gift, I believe, that I was given because it's like winning the lottery because without that gift of desperation, I wouldn't have had the willingness. I wouldn't have had the willingness because I still would have thought there was, I was gonna find an easier, softer way and another solution. And I wasn't ready to take the first step until I had exhausted every avenue. There was nowhere else to go. And um, really, I was so scared for my marriage and I was so, I grew up in addiction and I just was so scared for my kids and um, financially everything. I was just so scared. My back was literally against the wall. I mean, I, I can't fear it, um, but that's the gift of desperation. And I sat in that room and I, I kind of went and it's my home group and uh, I went a few weeks, you know, and I kind of, you know, being the kind of person that notices how to get things done, you know, <laughs> I looked around and I was kind of beginning to see a team, you know, I was kind of going, right, you know, I, you know, I've seen a couple of people who had what I wanted. And I was kind of starting to notice, you know, that they were the people that had put down the food. They were the people that were doing service. They were the people that were talking about God. They were the people that went up to the newcomers at the end of the meeting. They were the people that said things like, I'm struggling with X in my life. So I did a 10 step and rang my sponsor. Um, on my 11 step nightly review, I noticed X. So I made my amends to Y. You know, I started to hear all this stuff. Um, anyway, I asked one of those people who had what I wanted, would she be my sponsor? And she said, yes. And I have the same sponsor today. And like, just, I, I'll never be able to thank her enough. Um, I know she's not God and she's not my God or anything like that, but she is, she, God has spoken through her to me. Um, and um, I think what I've learned is it's, it's, and I heard this yesterday again, I hadn't heard it in ages. You pick up all the great sayings on that, you know, when you hear people, you know, you got to act your way into, into right thinking, you know, you can't right think your way into actions. And that was the stuff, you know, and so that's, I think, you know, what, what, what was different. I wasn't, you know, arguing about food plans. I wasn't um, going, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Um, I always say there was no buts. There wasn't like when she was saying, well, you know, in the morning, this is what you do in the morning. I wasn't going, but I've got three kids. I have a job. I was like, you know, I just got up earlier. You know, um, when it was suggested, you know, that I do a more in-depth nightly review you know, I want to say, but I have to put my children to bed. I have to read stories. I have to, it, it, you just, I just found a way. I just found a way to get this stuff done. Um, you know, what she was saying to me, you need to get out the sponsor. In my, my disease is going, I've nothing to offer. I can't sponsor it. Jeez, I don't have, no, the big book, you know, off by heart. I don't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm no good. Uh, you know, she just suggested to me, if you're abstinent and you're in recovery, you have something to offer somebody who's still eating, you know, and that's it. You just get on and, do, you know, do it. I don't mean that sound harsh, but, you know, that, that's the reality. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, so that's kind of what's worked, you know. Um, I have a physical allergy and I have a mental obsession. I would like to point out, um, you know, and maybe for some people this might resonate with them, but my, my abstinence today is not the abstinence that I started off with. I've had to let go, you know, several other substances um, you know, and other things are now part of my abstinence that weren't at the beginning. So the times I have my meals, you know, need to be part of my abstinence. Those various other things have gone. I've also had to look at my, my relationship to, you know, with money, with spending. I've had to do all the work on that. Um, you know, I've had to do lots of work around my marriage. Uh, alcohol has gone. Um, various foods that were on my plan in the beginning are not on my plan now. Um, because for me, I see that if I'm using anything for ease and comfort, it will eventually bring me back to the food. It will eventually bring me back to the food. Because um, I'm that in the gutter, 
like you know and I think I have the predisposition probably to be into anthem really you know um so just you know but again I I'm saying this to people and to my to remind myself that I didn't I didn't learn this at the beginning this has all come over a period of time um my sponsor always says that you know recovery is like peeling off layers you know and God gives you the layer to look at when you're ready you know I wouldn't have been ready to look at a lot of the stuff from the beginning you know but pain has brought me to look at a lot of stuff um and you know I suppose in terms of you know where I'm at now um uh, the last year has been particularly challenging for me. I have had um, some, you know, uh, my father died on Christmas Day. My daughter almost died during the year last year. She's had two brain surgeries. We've merged our business in the middle of all of that. There's been, I've had four things <laughs> that are considered highly stressful, you know, um, things in, in a year. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I really, I nearly went back into the food. When my dad died, I was like, I can't take any more. I just said, I just can't take any more. And um, yeah, I, I just thought. And in retrospect, what I'd like to kind of say about that is that I see that when my daughter was sick, um, I was, first of all, I did it, I was doing a lot of service. Um, I was doing a lot of service. I was doing a lot of sponsoring. I was on the board here. It, the OA board I had a role there and um, I was doing service online and um, I was doing a lot of service um, and you know I've heard this said this is coming up a lot so maybe and again this might resonate for some people and it may not at all you know um, I think it was Harlan mentioned it you know you know confusing steps 10 and 11 with steps 12 and um, so I, I you know I'm doing all this service um, but my 10s are slipping and my 11 is slipping. Um, when my daughter was so sick, she was in intensive care. She was in hospital for a very, very long time. And when we got her home, um, I had nurses in here around the clock. And, you know, it, for me, when I look back on it, I was staying abstinent and, and all of that, but I definitely was into this guilt of, I can't be doing all this, you know, I can't be doing 10 steps and ringing people and, you know, doing all this, like, you know and I definitely think with the trauma and all like that I suppose what I'm saying is if somebody was to come to me with something similar you know I'd be I'm thinking I may well have benefited from you know just taking one person through the book because it would have kept me in you know I would say you know um look at what you're doing what's what's the benefit and I'm saying this for people who are struggling with relapse that maybe are around five minutes great thanks a million that, you know, our long term around, you know, or the program is sliding, you know, because that's what when I look back now, you know, all of this stuff, I had that human build up, the build up of human emotion all in me, the fear around my daughter's death, the, you know, her, 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 you know, the possibility of her dying, the, the her seriousness of her illness, my other children, the financial insecurity with the business, the whole legal stuff with the business, everything. Um, and I think so when my dad, you know, contracted COVID, um, I had nothing like I, 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 I was really I won't say I was running on empty, but I was definitely struggling. And I believe had I not rung my sponsor, I believe that I was gone back out there. And I am so grateful to my sponsor. I am so grateful to God, firstly because I did not want to ring this woman and tell her that, um, that I, I, was, I was so scared. And, um, you know, what did I do? Just go back and do the steps again. Just, I just went back and did the steps again. I pulled back from all my commitments. Um, I, I, I just, it was the whole year just caught on top of me. Um, I needed to mind myself, mind my family. Um, and yeah, so, you know, we're March now, you know, I'm obviously grieving for my father. My daughter has turned a bit of a corner. I'm so grateful. It's a miracle. Um, and, you know, I have a new, I've taken on one new sponsee. And um, I do, I get more than one meeting every day. Um, uh, I probably get about two. 
um i um my main focus at the moment is is really my spirituality part of the program you know i email my food you know i make my two calls every day i do my step tens you know i do all that piece but my thing is conscious contact like going to meetings is not working or living a spiritual program you know ringing a member and fellowship i love fellowship i have met the nicest people who i love in the rooms but that's fellowship am i living the program what step am i on you know what's my home life look like today how is my marriage how's my relationship with my children and the things that work for me are to put in place the tools that get me to god that's what the tools are for the, the tools are not a contract for me to be x weight and x size and clothes i do this for you god and you get me skinny no the tools in my experience and i'm just speaking for me you know are to get me closer to god you know and god speaks to me through members and that's how i get you know i get through, get a connection with god but for me i'm spending a lot more time in my morning prayer meditation um, I'm not ticking boxes on charts, you know, yes, I do. I am accountable, but it's not about the boxes. It's about the act of what I'm doing, who I'm doing it with um, and the connection I'm trying to make in in my service and all like that. My 11 step has become much more, much, much more. I used to spend about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It's become a lot more. How do I make that happen? I don't leave it till I go to bed because then I'm just falling asleep. I put an alarm on my phone and I do it early. <laughs> that's the only things I can do. You know, that's how I try and make it work. Um, what's my 11 step telling me at the minute? Did it last night. Um, I was a bit short with my son. He's very enthusiastic about someone that I consider a fanatic and I kind of jumped on his opinion. What do I need to do? See it in my 11 step. You know, go back, apologize to him. You know, um, my husband, you know, is a bit a business kind of thing, you know, go back and make an amends Um, see where, you know, and the, these aren't being really humble. Like these are things that I see in my day that I apply the program to. I have a teenage daughter, you know, I can be a bit, you know, food policey. I'm watching what she's eating. So I have to, you know, ask God to forgive me for that and show me a new way, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and you see, if I don't deal with that stuff, it will eventually lead me back to the food because I won't be able to deal with the resentment and the anger and the self-pity and all the stuff that comes up, you know. But I suppose, you know, I'm, I feel really humble. Like I'm a bite away, like I'm a bite away, you know. Um, and, you know, this program, you know, and I'll finish on this, you know, I thought there was like a lottery ticket or like the golden ticket inside the Wonka bar that some people got and I wasn't going to get one or there's a magic food plan, or these people have what it takes and I haven't got what it takes. All, all I can say is it just seems to be perseverance, you know, and you just get up every morning and you do the work. Like it, there's no, there's no reason why, you know, someone gets it, someone, it's, you know, and I'll finish now. It's like, what are you not willing to do? You know, so what am I not willing to do? What do I struggle with? I struggle with step tens, doing them immediately. And I struggle with the nightly review, right? So I'm uh, just to explain there, that's what I had to put in place for the nightly review. Because the consequences are, if I don't do that, I'm going to go back to the food. The step 10, if I don't do the step tens, I'm going to have to build up a human emotion. What's going to happen? Unmanageability. And the last thing that will happen is I will pick up. It could be the last thing. It won't be the first thing. It'll be the last thing, you know. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. God, I sound very <laughs> passionate, but I suppose you know, I've had a history of relapse. I've had things happen that have now I've never experienced before. But like, God, it, it, this disease will kill me. It'll kill me, you know. And like, God, I got such a fright, you know. Um, I really got such a fright. And, and God is good, you know, um, you know, that footprints thing where he's carrying you, you know, it's, you know, maybe I was carried and, you know, anyway, here we are now, but all we have is today. So listen, thanks for listening to me. Um, and look, maybe that's it. That was meant to come out, whatever, whatever it's worth anyway. Thanks a million, Rosie. Arita, sorry. <laughs> thanks so much, Amelia. Thanks a million. I'll just stop the recording.